hello, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, David. And thank you to everybody. And well done, David, for organizing this and everyone who's put this together in these very strange uh, times. Um, yeah, and really nice to be here. And it's kind of moving just to see that, that great animation and just to see uh, LGBTQI people engaging with these issues because that's kind of one of the reasons I guess why I wrote my book in the in the first place because we weren't really engaging with them and there clearly was a problem also another problem is my hair just want to apologize for the fact that I look like a scarecrow that's rolled out of bed I, I, to be honest I probably always look like this but it's just a good excuse that we've got a pandemic to blame it on that isn't it but um yeah I thought I'd mention that um so yes my name is Matthew Todd uh, just a little bit about me and how I came to write Straight Jacket I uh, was born in 1973 grew up in the 80s, um, was very aware in the early 80s when I realized I was gay, I, I was, would have been about 1984, 1983, just exactly as the same time as HIV and AIDS were exploding into the world, certainly the Western world. And accompanying that was the kind of crazy uh, homophobic hysteria in the press. And I know things aren't perfect now, certainly when it comes to, to the discussion of trans people, um, but it was absolutely ferocious then. I mean, there's a chapter in my book about this and there's very, some of this will be triggering by the way, um, hopefully not too triggering, but just some of the stuff that, that in the book is very triggering just about how they described at that point, it was kind of gays and lesbians pretty much. They're the only people that were talked about sometimes bisexual, certainly not really trans people, very occasionally a little bit of hatred flung in their way, but on the whole, it was gays and lesbians who were kind of targeted with hatred and, and um, at that point, uh, the Labour Party had begun to support gay and lesbian rights as it was then. And so the conservative sporting press, the Sun, the News of the World, the Times, the Express and so on, the Telegraph were ferociously homophobic, portraying this idea that Labour were the party that wanted to make your children gay, um, the party of gays and lesbians of deviants, quote unquote, um, who, who essentially were out to kind of spread AIDS across the country. In fact, there were I was one story the sun ran about um, bisexual people having revenge sex to give uh, straight people HIV and AIDS. It was just such an incredibly dark period. And people of my generation were absorbing all of that negativity. Um, 1988, obviously we had section 28, Mrs. Thatcher brought in to prohibit the promotion of homosexuality uh, by local authorities and schools, which essentially stopped as most of you will know um, teachers being able to deal with homophobic bullying and that's and I was slap bang in the middle of that I was 14 or 15 in 19, 1988 and really needed to hear teachers just saying it's okay to be who you are and I, and I didn't hear that and was really struggling although I didn't really understand it at the time because at the, at the time I was quite loud I was quite confident I was quite funny um, and I was very in your face and the, I guess the more people kind of were hostile and they weren't always because some of them were my friends and some of them weren't homophobic, but when people were, and certainly some of the teachers were, I guess the more kind of outlandish and over the top I became. Eventually I came out to a youth group, which was held in a, in a bed sit um, near where I lived. Strangely enough, I, I just was shocked to know that there were gay people living in South London. I, I thought there was about hundred gay people who lived kind of somewhere in central London. That's the way the kind of press made it out as if we were this tiny minority. And so I went to the youth group and came out and finally realized that uh, the gay people weren't this kind of terrible monsters that they'd been portrayed as in, in the press. And that was kind of difficult. It was amazing that, you know, to come out um, and to be with other LGBT people um, and made some amazing friends, went to my first gay bar when I was 17, went to Pride and became very kind of politically engaged because I thought, my goodness, you know, um, the press has been lying, the world has been lying to me, you know, everywhere I, everywhere I turned, I heard these terribly homophobic things. And I felt like I really needed to try to help change some of the situations. And obviously all the laws were very different. The age of consent was 21 for gay men. Um, the, there was an armed forces ban, no civil partnership rights or marriage or anything like that. I ended up working at Stonewall for a bit when it had first begun, been going about four or five years. There were many calls you take from people from lesbian women who'd been together for 25 years and the partner had died and the family of the person who died would come along and kick the woman out of her home that she'd shared because there were no partnership rights. There were cases where uh, there was a man who'd been in, a, in a, some kind of crash, car crash, and uh, 
his family wouldn't let his partner of X amount of years be at the bedside. They made the decision to turn off the machine. He wasn't allowed to go to the funeral. Those things were just very, very common. So it was a very, very um, difficult time. But I also remember early on just knowing that lots of the, the, the people I was meeting, lots of people I was making friends with seemed to have issues with low self-esteem. Um, lots of people around me seemed to have problems with relationships. Um, lots of people were drinking too much. And as things went on, I, I had an amazing time. I'm sure lots of you can relate to this. I was out on the gay scene. Um, I had a few relationships. First one was nice. Second one was a bit unstable to say the least. It was a bit of verging on domestic violence going on. It was, wasn't very good. And as I gradually moved on, I started to think uh, well, the, having these relationships seems to be very difficult. And I seem to beca become uh, either I'm kind of scared when someone gets too close, I run away or either I become incredibly clingy and, and almost very kind of obsessive. And I noticed I was when I look back now, I don't think I noticed it at the time, but I, I know now when I look back, I was drinking a lot. And I remember the very first time I went to um, a gay bar when I was 17. It was a place called the Palm Beach. It was a nightclub in, in Streatham above an ice rink. Um, it was a really fun place. And I remember the first time I had one lemon hooch that someone bought for me. I didn't, I was a bit scared of alcohol. Uh, I didn't really sipped it um, and uh, didn't, didn't have a huge impact on me. The next time I went, I remember having quite a few and suddenly the anxiety that I didn't even know I was living with suddenly reduced. And I suddenly relaxed for the first time that I can, I could remember at that point. And I was dancing with everybody on the dance floor to Madonna and Kylie at that point, they played Vogue 10 times a night, better the devil, you know, a million times a night. And I had an amazing time and it was a really transformational moment for me. And from then on, I drank quite a lot. I remember being with my first boyfriend in um, a house party and spending most of it being sick in, in the toilet. He was looking after me, bless him. And that became a pattern. Eventually I had this big relationship, which was just really not good. I think he was a bit of an alcoholic. I certainly was drinking too much. He was cheating. It was very hysterical, very dramatic. Don't leave me running through Croydon. There's a massive, I don't know, hopefully none of you know Croydon, but it's lots of flyovers and busy cars. And there were nights where we'd be rallying and I'd be staggering across the road, kind of missing cars, flying past, completely drunk, kind of not worrying whether I would be hit by a car or not. It's a miracle I, I kind of came out of that situation alive. Then I eventually moved into London and the internet became a thing. And I suddenly realized I could have uh, sex with people uh, without the emotional trauma or whatever, or engagement that came with having a relationship. And so I started sleeping with everybody I could get my hands on. So I went through this kind of phase of, or this new part of my life where I was basically drinking in the evening, trying to meet people, hung over the next day, hooking up with people from AOL.com as it was back in the day, um, and then eventually Gaydar, which seems very old now. Um, and, you know, some way will say what's not to like. And if that's what you want to do, and if you're happy doing that, that's fantastic. But, and I was happy at some times, uh, sometimes, and I had some amazing times in nightclubs, but it started to get to the point where it was a little bit too much. And I realized I wasn't in control of it. Throughout all of these years, when I was 17, uh, when, I, when I was at university, I'd had a family bereavement. I went to see a counsellor there. After about the second session, I was talk wanted to talk to the counsellor about some of the issues I had with low self-esteem and sexuality. And she was lovely, but she said to me, I'm straight and I don't know anything about gay issues. And uh, but at the end of the sixth session, she ended up thanking me for educating her about gay things, which was great, but not what I needed. I saw another therapist when I was about 30, when I was um, living here, where I live in North London, through my GP, who again was really great. She was nice, but the upshot of the conversation was, well, I know it was difficult for you growing up, but um, things are not so bad now and people are not homophobic anymore or not as homophobic. So what's there to say? But the, clearly there was a lot more to say, but I didn't know because I was going to the counsellor for help. And also through um, sexual health, health services, I was oft, often uh, would ask to speak to somebody when I, every time I'd had any kind of sexual interaction and most of the time it wasn't risky at all but I'd be convinced I had HIV and I would go uh, constantly for another HIV test another HIV test another HIV test and I would ask to see the counsellors there and uh, lots of gay men who were often very kind and sweet and well-meaning but couldn't give me any answers didn't know I remember there's one younger guy who said to me well you're gay you drink and you know you're having sex that's what we do it's great he didn't I've mythologized that a little bit in my head that he was so flippant about it but 
that was a really confusing moment for me because I really needed some help because it is fine if that's what you want to do, but it was really taking control of my life. And there was another older man, I remember, much older man who was really helpful. And he said, I don't know the answers you're looking for, but I do know lots of people come to me saying the same thing. And that was a real key moment for me. All of this time, by this time I'd begun to work at Attitude, which at that point was uh, the kind of leading gay magazine. It was kind of at that time in the nineties, um, things had become, we'd, we'd gone through the, the horror of the eighties and, and antiretroviral drugs had just uh, appeared and started to save people's lives. People were HIV positive. And I think there was a kind of growing confidence and a certain need for the, uh, the, the gay community to express that confidence, maybe to have some fun, to, to, to focus on having some fun, rightly or wrongly. At that point, when I was in my 20s, I really responded to that and I really was happy to, to be working at Attitude. But I noticed that there were lots of people there amongst the staff who were struggling too. I mean, over the years, there was a guy who um, didn't actually work at Attitude, worked at another gay magazine. He took his own life. He was quite well known at the time. There were people that would be sometimes taking drugs in the office. Over the years, I was there for a long time, 20 years. So it wasn't all like it all happened at once, but it was other people who'd be asleep on their desks from taking drugs on a Monday morning. And there was one guy who was gay, who was the brother of Attitude's advertising executive, who is straight, who's still there now. And he gave me permission to write about it in the book. His brother was gay, came to work at the magazine for a year while his brother went off on honeymoon for a year. and. After the brother had come back, Rob had left. And I heard over the years, by the time I became editor in 2008, that Rob wasn't doing very well. He was HIV positive, which he found very, very difficult to, to cope with. I know not everybody does, and thank goodness. Um, he'd been in a difficult relationship, had been beaten up, had been homophobically attacked a few times on the bus for holding hands with his partner, he started taking drugs. Things had got worse and worse and worse and worse, was drinking too much and eventually took his own life. And it was a really devastating blow because I needed and we all needed and certainly his brother and his family needed some answers and there weren't any answers and it seemed to be why was this so common eventually to cut a long story short um a friend of mine who was struggling uh with an eating disorder who would often become very 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 overweight and then lose it all and go through a phase of being compulsively exercising and compulsively weighing his food and then go through a couple of years of being very slim and then put all that weight back on was just going through this cycle continually and eventually went to the doctors and said that he was going to kill himself and the doctor suggested he went to Overeaters Anonymous and that really worked for him, it changed his life. Um, and he said to me, I think you've got a problem. And I began my journey of recovery. Met a gay therapist who said to me for the first time ever, of course you're screwed up, you're gay, which was a confront confronting thing to say, but then went on to explain that of course, it's not that your sexuality is the problem in itself, it's the way society has treated you and the way society treats all of us LGBTQI people. And that was a huge revelation, which seems really obvious now, but people weren't talking about it then. It was considered to be a taboo to talk about these things because, you know, we all wanted to wave the pride flag and be positive and importantly, you know, say to young people, of course, you know, it's okay to be gay and it gets better. And, you know, you can be LGBTQ and, you know, have a great life, which is absolutely true. So I wrote about it in Attitude in 2010. Um, big 10 page feature called how to begin happy and we had more letters uh, about it than we ever had about anything before or since um, and eventually I wrote a book about it which is straight jacket which came out in 2016 which has been a big hit and essentially it is a very difficult book to read it's very triggering it just goes into the problems that we have the painful things that we go through when we're growing up the way society shames us there's a really key study which um I won't go into it in a huge amount of depth, but it's um, uh, a study in California that basically showed um, that the more adverse uh, childhood experiences any child has, the more likely uh, they will be as adults to have some of these problems. So depression, anxiety, uh, drug issues, uh, suicide ideation, really terribly awful and very serious Things. And it wasn't it wasn't a gay study by any means, but it looked at it, it classed adverse childhood experiences, various different things, but even just being in a family where the parents were divorced, um, a child experiencing physical abuse or emotional abuse or sexual abuse, or a whole bunch of what was serious illness like cancer, a whole bunch of different things. And they presumed that 
the most damaging thing would be sexual abuse. And of course, that's in the, one of the most terrible things that can happen to a, to a child growing up. But they actually found the thing that um, damaged or was most likely to have an, uh, to cause some of these things like addiction and depression when a child grew up was to experience what they called chronic recurrent humiliation. In other words, being told, you're not okay, you're not good, you're not very, you're, you're bad, you, it's, who you are, what you are is not acceptable. And I think that what we go through as LGBTQ people, as kids, when we aren't able to be who we are because society generally is not very supportive, and I know it's getting better in some places and some schools are better, but essentially we go through this experience where we're shamed and shame can work. Some people, um, you know, argue about this, some psychologists, but some therapists would say that shame works in a positive way in terms of setting boundaries. So if a child is going near to a fire and the parent shames it, it's, don't do that, don't do that. And it learns every time it goes near to the fire, it will get told off. And that kind of relationship with the parent will be kind of threatened for a moment. So when it steps back from the fire and that parent bond is restored again, it learns eventually to not go near the fire. But when you're LGBTQ and if you're expressing, um, you know, saying, oh, I, I find that man attractive or you're a woman saying I find that girl attractive or being gender non-conforming, which lots of us are. I certainly was, you know, gender is very strictly policed. So when I was... I don't know, I went to see Starlight Express, the musical, the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical when I was 11, I was obsessed with that, wasn't considered to be a thing that boys should do, didn't like football, um, liked uh, Kylie, then Madonna, all of these things were constantly, I was constantly receiving messages from my parents, friends, parents, uh, parents of friends from school, these things are not what boys do, and so gradually you start to realise I can't change that, it's, it's me inside, that is just something that I am. And so you start understanding that it's not the thing you're doing that is wrong, but it's you that's wrong. And I think that's when you kind of get toxically shamed and you start to think at a subconscious level, there's something wrong with me. And I think that is the key numbers. There's more straight cisgendered people in the world that have these problems. You go to recovery meetings, it's mostly straight cisgendered people, but we are disproportionately represented, disproportionately affected. There's many studies now. I think 2013 uh, UK crime report showed that the, the group that used dr illicit drugs the most was gay men. 33% of gay men had gay or bisexual men had used illicit drugs in the last six months. The next group down was uh, lesbian or bisexual women who were 22%. And I think straight men uh, were down at 11% of those had used drugs. So there is a dis disproportionate problem. And this isn't about demonizing drugs or alcohol or sex or whatever it may be. It's about enabling us and empowering us to talk about these, these things to acknowledge that maybe perhaps there are stronger chances that maybe you know some of us might not feel great about ourselves and that we might turn to drink or drugs or whatever it may be is a way of kind of medicating those painful feelings and supporting each other and just helping each other and and you know when someone said in the animation that um they'd seen the the problem with drugs in the community it's certainly i'm seven years sober now from alcohol uh and i don't go out clubbing as much but all i need to do is turn on an app and you see people selling drugs, people talking about being horny and high. And again, it's not about demonizing that, but it's just lots of people get into trouble. And certainly in London where I am, and I'm sure it's the same, it's been the same wherever I go across the country, certainly in big cities, people get into really serious problems. Not everybody, but you know, destroys lives, people lose their jobs, people lose relationships. And I think it's about us, um, I've just got my two minute warning. I don't know when that came, but I will finish now anyway. But it's about us just uh, empowering ourselves, taking care of each other, looking after one another, because we deserve to be as happy and thrive and to thrive as much as, as anyone does. And I think um, now's the time for us to do some healing about all the things that have happened to us in the past. Let's look after ourselves and each other and try and, uh, yeah, just try and make it a little bit easier for the generation that's uh, coming up underneath us. Thanks very much. Thank you.